Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. Indeed. First week of the Paschal season, of course, this past bright week, but the Lord continues even as He did before our creation, after our creation, through the prophets, through the Old Testament, through the judges, after the period of His incarnation, through His earthly ministry, and even after His resurrection, to seek out those who are lost. Whatever means it takes, that we might have our souls lifted up, that we might die, that we might live, instead of gaining life, that we might lose it. He meets us where we are. When the soldiers come into him in the garden, they say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am. They fall to the ground, not only because it was the power of God, but because he knew his audience, he knew these people at the name of God would fall to the ground. This was not a name that was mentioned lightly. He was trying to seek out even their salvation. We can learn from this ourselves, never to flippantly say the name of God, even though it's so commonplace in our culture. He comes to Pilate and says who he is. He says who he is to the Pharisees. No one has any excuse. From the cross, he is witnessing to his glory. And the young John stands there in boldness with his mother by the cross, witnessing this same event that he too would later proclaim, as we hear in the Acts and throughout his writings. He comes out of the tomb, not needing to remove the stone, but this is a question for the women. How would the stone be rolled away? So he had the stone rolled away. But this is he who eventually, eight days later, goes through doors when they are shut. He doesn't really need to move the stone, but he does so. He appears to them. He has angels tell them that he is risen. He stands before Mary and sa Mary Magdalene and says, Mary, and she recognizes him. He appears to Luke and Cleopas and breaks bread with them, and then their eyes are open to see. What they need, he gives. He says, go tell Peter and the apostles that I am risen. To rise up Peter from his doubts and hurt after he had denied Christ three times. Over and over he does what is necessary. And to Thomas, he comes through doors when they are closed to show forth that he is risen. This is not just a normal thing happening here. Something amazing has happened here. He knows Thomas has doubts. But don't they all have doubts? One of the writers I was reading points this out. We, we tend to single out Thomas because he wanted to see. But the reality is when he came straight to the apostles, they had to see him. He showed them his wounds. Then they believed. They don't make as big a deal out of it in the writing. But they had to see it too. When the women came and told them that this had happened, they didn't believe them. Remember, they were amazed at this, but they didn't believe. They ran to verify it themselves. Because in this part of this ancient world, in their culture, it had to be an adult male to witness to something. They did want to witness. Couldn't be a woman, couldn't be a youth. Their culture, not ours. But that was the way it was. Shepherds didn't witness, as one of us and I talked about this week. But notice, when John runs to the tomb with Peter, in his great zeal, he outruns Peter, but Peter goes in first. It is not despite popular belief that John was timid. John knew his place. He was a youth. Peter got to go in first because he was the adult male to be the first witness that others might believe. And then he witnessed. He does this with Thomas because Thomas needs to see something too, to have this witness, not only of the adult males that he was with, to show him forth as who he is. Now Thomas is badly misunderstood, as we've talked about in the past in our culture. This whole concept of a doubting Thomas, you might need to realize, is, is a Western construct. It's not an Orthodox construct at all. The word's really not used very often for Thomas. We do talk about his doubts in the service last night. We also talk about, over and over, his decisiveness. When the Lord said that he had to go to be with 
Lazarus. Lazarus has died. Thomas shows decisiveness. Let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas knew what was going on. Thomas saw the anxiety that the Lord had raised in the people around him. The Pharisees were furious. Thomas knew the possibility and went anyway with him. And when the Lord comes to him, once again he is decisive. He shows him his hands and tells him he can put his fingers into them and to thrust his hand to his side. And Thomas, as we hear beautifully, says, My Lord and my God. Not something uh, Hebrew of that time would have flippantly said. Not something we should flippantly say. And he said it as one, had we been there, that sounds like he was realizing his desperation, his pain of heart, at the loss he had experienced and the loss of his Lord days before. He was overjoyed to reach out and grasp for his Lord, because he needed it for his salvation. There was no salvation in princes and sons of men, but only in this man that was incarnate. <coughs> My Lord and my God. As Theophon the Recluse says, when we partake of the Holy Chalice, when we kiss the side of that chalice, we should say, My Lord and my God. Because truly, we are touching the side of the Lord ourselves. But when Thomas made this decisive decision for this moment, he goes out with the other apostles. We don't even know I believe it was Archbishop of Erke, I was reading what Thomas was doing outside with the others. Was he hiding more? Or was he out doing necessary work for them, getting them food, whatever they needed? He was bold to be outside. <clears throat> he came days later and eventually goes to India and eventually goes across the world and eventually witnesses before kings and is tortured and eventually martyred because of that experience of my Lord and my God. Life changes for him radically. We can learn from him. Now in the Greek tradition, what he is most commonly called is not doubting Thomas, but pistostolos, faithful Thomas. Something that should penetrate our hearts. He is pistostolos, with faith, pistis, the Greek word. Because Thomas was faithful. Yes, he had to see. Then he followed with vehemence and never turned back. Not for a moment did he turn back. He had to leave whatever he had, the job that he knew, the family that he had, whatever he had, and go and follow. But yet he did, because he had had that experience of my Lord and my God. But the Lord doesn't leave it there with him. He takes it a step further, realizing that there's a higher level that he must attain to. Blessed are those who have not seen and will believe. You could say that was us, but I would might say that's false too, because most of us have seen. We see things each and every day in our lives, whether it be the holy mysteries themselves, whether it be the announcement of Christ is risen at Pascha, whether it be our reading of the scriptures, whether it be individuals around us that show us the presence of Christ, whether it be nature itself, God is everywhere present to fill us to all things. We should more frequently cry out, my Lord and my God, ourselves. Today is also the feast of, one of the feasts of St. John the Theologian, that miracle of when he reposes and they go to his grave a few days later and this miraculous dust comes out, but there's no John the Theologian, bodily translated himself. But this is John who follows from the beginning and continues to follow. And you read his life, we are such a timid culture now. We don't want to hear anything firm and strong. John would go into pagan temples and smash the idols himself. That would be called a hate crime today, I'm sure. But this is what John did. This is what Thomas did. Because the people needed to be saved from the demons, and he knew it, and they knew it, and they loved the people enough to do it. And they went before anyone. And if you read their rhetoric, they weren't soft on these things whatsoever. And they proclaimed the gospel with vehemence because life had changed. Everything had changed. He said over and over, with Pascha last week, but also 2,000 years ago, 
Everything has to change, as I will keep reiterating. You can't go on with life as it was. You can't be confronted with the living God standing right in front of us. See his wounds, which we do. Feel his love and his mercy and his joy. And not say anything but my Lord and my God. But when that happens, we have to move and be different. No longer can life go on as it was. Things have to change. Whatever fisher nets we have that are distracting us from God need to be cast aside. If the Lord says, come follow me, put those down and come follow me. I'm not speaking of our work that we do for our salvation. I'm talking about things that become distractions to our calling, to the purpose that we have. So in this season, while the temptation may be to loosen the reins a little bit, that was not the reaction of the apostles with Pascha. The reaction was more fervency, more zeal toward God, more diligence, more prayer, more struggle, more adding fire to fire, more turning to God each and every moment in prayer, more abstinence from sin, complete abstaining from sin when possible, absolutely, all the time. But turning to God with vehemence. I was speaking to someone the other day that was speaking about the fast and how easy it is to fall this time of year into just absolute gluttony again. I pointed out to them the example of Elder Joseph the Hezekiah. Now most of us are not going to be Elder Joseph the Hezekiah. But Elder Joseph came up with a plan for his spiritual life early on with his co-struggler, which is, I think, very edifying in that for days he wouldn't eat at all. But then he realized none of the other monks were doing what he was doing. There he was. So he decided with his co-struggler, the cave builder Arsenios, that they would eat once a day, no matter what, 365 days a year. Now that might be a bit much for some of us, might be a little bit little for some of us. But for Elder Joseph, it kept things always his hands to the plow. Because Bright Monday didn't come around, he, he got to be a glutton. Didn't happen. Couldn't happen. He ate once a day. The fast days didn't come and he didn't, didn't be too zealous and prideful because once a day, no matter what. It's a good plan. Maybe that's not for us, but something similar could be a good idea for us. To find something that we can do that sustains us, to stick to it 365 days a year because Christ didn't disappear on Bright Monday. He's here fervently today, tomorrow, after the Paschal season, each and every day, each and every moment. Thomas follows, John follows, saying, My Lord and my God, proclaim that message to the world by their lives, by their words, by their deeds. And that must be us. Because once Christ is risen, all things are new. Nothing can be the same again. The chains have been broken. The wrongs have been smashed. Our hearts should be melted, the growing now with the flowers, with the fruit of the season, of Pascha, that Christ has come for us to bring all men to himself, that we all might be able to ascend with him and sit at the right hand of the Father into the ages. Amen. Amen.